Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start allowing some participants in, or all participants in, um, or attendees, I should say, um, because we have a lot to get to uh, this morning. Um, looks like people are starting to populate in, and it'll just be Stephen and I today for the 15th edition of the Marcus Hour. Uh, this should be an exciting one, uh, a very informative and jam-packed session. Uh, we've it's it's really a, a lot of important stuff that we're going to get to, um, from board member participation to property property manager involvement, uh, and everything in between, uh, and a lot of updates that even if it's not legislation right now what we will see uh, in the in the next few years um, and what we kind of expect in 2024 and beyond. Um, so as people start to populate in, uh, let's just get right to it. Uh, I'm gonna get the slideshow going. Uh, so let me share my screen. And I'm gonna hit start slideshow. So welcome to the 15th edition of the Marcus Hour. Uh, we appreciate all of you attending today. Uh, we are Alcock and Marcus, uh, a full service condominium uh, HOA community association law firm uh, located in Braintree, Massachusetts. We also have a new office in, in Miami, Florida, um, and we practice in Massachusetts, uh, Florida, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Maine. Um, and we have been doing the Marcus Hour. Uh, now we have been doing it. Uh, now, now it's our 15th edition. So we've been doing it for over a year. Uh, so it looks like we are both here. We don't have a, we don't have a guest today. Uh, so you only have the, uh, the two Marcuses, uh, myself, Jake Marcus, uh, and we have my comrade, Stephen Marcus. Stephen, anything you'd like to add before we get going? Um, is this for my seven minutes or is that coming up? It's coming up. Okay. Yeah. I'm a little under the weather today. So, uh, uh, I think it's the pollen, uh, but yeah, yeah. Well, allergies, allergies have been crazy. I'm starting to uh, uh, some uh, of the pollen collect on my car, but I'll count on you to carry the, uh, uh, the row, the biggest door or whatever. The expression is i'll 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 try my best uh, uh, so yes yeah, so we we today uh are going to get to uh some pretty important topics um and i wanted to point out before we get started as always none of this is supposed to be legal advice if you have specific questions to your association to your particular set of facts not every even if it sounds like the same situation Make sure you contact your counsel attorney, go through the, the topics involved, um, see what the updates are as far as legislation. We, we try to stay ahead of the curve on all of it. Uh, we do a, a lot of what I will discuss today is supposed to be guidance, best practices, not again, not legal advice. Um, and the reason I say that, especially for today's, is because a lot of this is uh, about to be law in Florida. Uh, as it relates to board members and property managers and CAMs. Um, and I think the biggest thing to look for out of these uh, new updates uh, legislatively is that even if they aren't the law in Massachusetts, it gives good a good indication of what you need to do in following uh, your requirements as a board member. You have a fiduciary duty as a board member. Uh, and I'm speaking of board members. And, and and speaking of that, I do want to share uh, a couple poll questions just so we know who we're who we're who we have as participants today. It's always good to have that information. So I'm gonna I'm gonna launch. What is your involvement uh, with condominiums, board member, property manager, vendor, council, attorney, uh, or other? Um, and I'm seeing people start to vote. Thank you for participating. Uh, this kind of helps us get an idea. Uh, I'm seeing mostly board members. So yes, uh, this is a very important uh, subject today for board members. It's not supposed to scare you off because again, it's not the law yet in uh, uh, or some of the jurisdictions that we practice in. Um, 
or any of the jurisdictions, essentially. Um, so that is, uh, and, and also to that end, I actually want to, I would do want to send uh, what state you work in, just so we have that as well. Uh, and, and what we can do in uh, future ones is I know there are some attorneys on the call uh, from different parts of the country and local, and there are some insurance agents on the call from different parts of the country and local, and there are some insurance carriers or and or managing general agents on the call uh, from all over the country. We already got a great question. Do the property managers have any fiduciary responsibilities? Um, technically, no. But uh, as a employee or or, or a, a someone who works on behalf of the association, those are generally the paid employees who are uh, running the operations of the associations. Uh, so different different kind of requirement. And the other thing is, even if they don't have a fiduciary responsibility, uh, we do see uh, CAMs uh, have a, th th there's certain requirements that will be added and certain, um, certain standards that CAMs have to meet. Uh, so there, there are also, um, with the management agreement and with state laws, uh, there are contractual liabilities and there are uh, statutory liabilities. Correct. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just send one more poll just so we know what states we're in. Um, so feel free to answer that. Massachusetts, Florida, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, other. Um, looks like mostly Massachusetts, uh, which makes sense. So, okay. And, just, and now, I know at least one of the managers, uh, Great Great North is in uh, uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And maybe yep. a few of the others are as well. Okay. And yeah. some of them might be in Rhode Island as well. Yeah. So yep. I, I'm assuming that people are answering where they're mainly uh, managing properties, if they're property managers, uh, or if they're board members, they're managing what state their condominium is in. Right. So so the, the question was, what state do you work in? Uh, it does look like mostly Massachusetts. We have a mishmash uh, from other states. Um, and mostly in New England um, and other. Um, and yeah, so it, 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 it could be if you're an insurance agent, you could be servicing multiple. Um, but thank you for answering those questions. Do, like some do, you have, do you have that third poll question, Jake? Yeah, I was going to do that on the next slide. Okay. Um, so what I, what I kind of wanted to point out uh, is that uh, a, a lot of this may not be the law right now. Uh, it's not, again, what we provide isn't legal advice, but this is important information to realize what you need to do as far as potential um, educational requirements going forward, uh, record keeping, uh, you know, ensuring that you're complying with your fiduciary duty, ensuring that you're complying with, and I see someone mentioned in the chat, uh, property manager code of ethics. Um, and a lot of the, the, what we talk about today is what the new requirements based on some, uh, developments, uh, in, in, in multiple jurisdictions, uh, board members legislation to look out for in board in board positions in 2024 and beyond. Uh, I want to kind of just discuss the backdrop before we get into the program and why we're here, why there are heightened requirements, why there are uh, more strict penalties um, as far as regulation, transparency. And I think a, a recurring theme in today's session will be more transparency from board members uh, or uh, property managers in dealing with contracts, in dealing with financial records, and providing financial records and and and, and allowing inspections of the of the books um, and everything in between. Uh, and let me just get into the backdrop um, before we get going. And I'm going to hand it over to you in a minute, Stephen. Um, the Surfside uh, Champlain Towers collapse. This was a 12-story beachfront property, coincidentally in Florida, um, that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, resulted in the death of 98 people. Um, this pretty much just flipped the condo world upside down. Uh, a lot of 
everyone, uh, everything has been changed since June of 2021 uh, after the Surfside Champlain Towers collapse. It, 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 it basically changed everything from structural integrity inspections to reserve requirements. For example, in the state of Florida, there are requirements to have a structural inspection statutorily by the end of this year. Um, or it, it, the, 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 it, it, it is in the statute, in, in, in the Florida Condo Act, um, and it also reserve requirements is also in the, in the Condo Act. Uh, that is probably foreshadowing what will happen in other jurisdictions. Uh, and what I mean by that is we will likely see um, structural integrity inspections, especially on uh, in coastal areas, um, uh, you know, along the shoreline, closer to the water, uh, just because of the, the 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 nuances with having to ensure that everything is is up to code. And basically, it, it's to ensure that nothing like Surfside ever happens again. Same with reserve requirements, making sure you have the the funds available to expend uh, money to invest in um, upgrading anything that's not up to par. Uh, and, and basically, yeah, this affected everything from lending to yeah structural integrity and reserves, uh, but also insurance, which Stephen will get to in a minute. One more topic I want to mention is the uh, Hammocks HOA embezzlement case. Again, this happened in Florida, um, but this was the biggest Florida HOA. And the board members, and, and again, the, the, the word of caution that comes out today, the fact that there are potential now criminal repercussions in the statute uh, in Florida and could carry its way to other jurisdictions is not to say that, oh, just because, uh, no, like this was a significant uh, operation. They, they were embezzling, uh, allegedly embezzling massive amounts of money uh, in yeah. this steel scheme, the the HOA is now in receivership. Uh, uh, was the check if I could interrupt the was the stealing by the because I've seen both. Um, uh, was the stealing by the a board member or the treasurer or was it by the management company? It was by four board members and I believe a brother of a of the president. Okay, so people have to know that it's not just management companies who could take funds that. Uh, board members also typically have check writing authority, could come up with fake employees, could do do other things. And it typically happens over a period of years and it goes un, un, uh, unnoticed. Uh, yeah. In Massachusetts, we have a good, uh, well, our recommendation in Massachusetts based on statute is uh, to get fidelity insurance, naming the manager as designated agent on your own policy. Otherwise, the principles of the management company aren't covered under the fidelity. But Massachusetts says an amount of at least three months assessments. Our recommendation is an amount equal to the most funds you ever have on hand. So, for example, if you have a million dollars in reserves and your budget is uh, 1.2 million a year, uh, three months, the minimum in Massachusetts would be 300,000. Our suggestion is if you have a million over that, uh, insure for fairly short dollars for the 1.3 million, naming the manager as designated agent and obligor under the fidelity insurance. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, you, it's the Marcus Hour, not just the Jake Marcus Hour. You know that, Stephen? Thank you, Jake. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to get a little bit more into the backdrop because I find the Hammocks case uh, in Florida, especially um, enlightening, because we now have uh, what is currently in the governor's desk to sign, probably by July first of this year in Florida. And 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 look, uh, the reason I keep saying Florida is because be, when it happens there, we will generally see it navigate to uh, other jurisdictions, including New England um, and and everywhere in between. Um, and and look, the the Hammocks case really struck a chord. Uh, with communities, uh, because you know, it there are we we get plenty of clients or unit owners who reach out and they have suspicion or they suspect that boards are engaging in fraud, engaging in kickbacks, engaging in self dealing. Uh, not to the extent of hammocks, but as Stephen mentioned, it happens slowly over time. Um, and usually, you know, the the biggest thing that we see with 
uh, what unit owners are able to do is kind of hopefully grouped if something is happening, uh, if there is suspicion, if there is indeed kickback, self-dealing, uh, conflicts of interest with contracts that, and, and this goes to the property managers, you know, if, if there's a conflict of interest in a contract that you enter into with a service provider, uh, there is now uh, going to be statute that, and again, in Florida, but could go into other states and some kind of a best practice, uh, ensure that conflict of interests are being disclosed before entering into a contract. Now, the issue now is, let's say a derivative action is brought by unit owners against board members. Uh, the letter can only go so far. Or, you know, even the other, like three board members think one, uh, another board member is not paying their fees or not, uh, or, or potentially taking some of the money. Um, that only has so much uh, strength. And, and litigation and attorney's fees are going to cost money borne by the unit owners and the other board members, and, and it's just chaotic. So I do think, in a way, even though it sounds scary, a lot of this new uh, legislation is good. And that's why I think it's good to, to, to start kind of engaging in more best practices um, to ensure that there's more transparency in the boards, uh, more transparency with the, the property managers that you hire, uh, the, the the you know as far as uh, I think a best practice would be a property manager who's terminated. Sometimes it can be a kind of that that comes with its own kind of set of issues, um, uh, because it can be you know a a, a hostile or, or or not not to uh not not a not a great uh, divorce. Uh, it it, it I, I think what Florida has is it'll be twenty days they have to provide all the records. Uh, within uh, or 20 days of termination, they have to provide all, provide all the records that they uh, possess or control back to the association. Um, and that kind of goes to a lot of what we're going to get into, keeping up, making sure the financials are transparent. Um, and uh, uh, just because, you know, there's a lot of suspicion in, 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 uh, in associations. And, 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 and that's kind of the thing we want to get to today. Uh, the result uh, is more requirements for volunteer board members, property managers, and other professionals um, in notifying owners of certain things, educational requirements for board members uh, and property managers, uh, in, in, and, um, and, 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 and really just transparency and regulation. Uh, and we're going to see a lot more of that and the increased responsibility of the board members beyond the fiduciary duty uh, as well as managers, and we want to kind of get into best practices. One thing uh, that we are going to get to next is, you know, what are the other factors that led to this? Um, technology, the technology boom has definitely led to that, and that goes into the electronic voting. I want to mention one thing. Uh, Florida enacted uh, virtual, or, or in their statute, there is a provision related to virtual meetings, uh, or electronic voting, virtual meetings. Um, and there are also going to be new requirements for websites of HOAs and condos. I think that is a good practice. Have a website, be able to upload your documents, be completely transparent. It's one thing to record with the state, and you can say that the unit owners and everyone in the community is on notice. But I think to a better extent, uh, if you have a website that only your unit owners can log into, uh, that is a good practice. Uh, and, and there's so many software companies coming out. We, I, I was just in uh, Las Vegas for CAI National, met a lot of vendors who have software to complete the electronic voting, to do the virtual meetings, to ens ensure the website looks good. Um, so that, that's kind of an important area that I kind of just wanted to note. Uh, technology is a, is a big reason for this, and it allows the transparency. Um, that said, make sure you're 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 able to uh, if you do email, if you mail, if you're allowed to, um, make sure you do both email and mail, just so it's it, the notice is is sufficiently um, is sufficiently out there. So that's kind of the trends. Um, I do want to uh, push it to Stephen, who wants to really who 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 is going to really discuss uh, an even more important area in this, um, and I think that is the. Uh, the uh, insurance uh, aspects. Uh, and that's kind of something that's been 
uh, a big a big topic across the nation. So Stephen, I'll I'll hand the mic to you. Thank you, Jake. I, I need like seven minutes, and it's not just insurance. It's uh, as important or more important as liability. Uh, but I also see that there was a question in Massachusetts can uh, management companies get kickbacks, find this ways. Uh, the answer is the statute says they cannot. Uh, however, in some cases, managers have become insurance agents and they're splitting uh, insurance commissions on master policies or they're real estate agents and uh, collecting brokers uh, commissions or splitting brokers commissions. Um, uh, that should be fully disclosed, but... Uh, Even... Can I just launch the uh, the insurance coverage? Uh, yeah. Question? I'm going to launch an insurance coverage question. Just take a look. Okay. If, uh, yeah, why don't we have people answer this and then I'll do my thing. So the question is, and it's a combination, how much general, comprehensive general liability and directors and officers and umbrella coverage over those two insurances does your association have, or if you manage associations, does your typical association have? Okay, so I'm saying- Are you um, seeing it? Are you seeing it, Stephen? Yes. Uh, it's still, uh, there's only 19 people responding. So four are at a million, four are at a, uh, two million, eight are at five million, two are at 10 million, one is at 25 million. Now, unfortunately, um, I'm going to scare you. And I think with uh, three items or one particular item, but three in total, that I'm gonna guess that you have never heard all of the information that I'm gonna say in the last, in the next seven minutes. So if you already knew everything that I said after I say it, uh, if you could put in the Q and A or in the chat, I knew all that, great. If you don't, you don't have to, but I'm guessing most board members don't know this and probably most managers don't. So, um, uh, the question starts easy, which is, as board members, you volunteers, you want to meet neighbors, uh, you moved in, you uh, talk to them at the pool. Um, uh, do you see any liability acting as trustees? Uh, do you have any concerns about potential liability? Let me let me uh let me let me do a raise your hand because uh, we we do have that feature with the technology. Uh, uh, Jay, Jake, I'm doing uh, the, I'm going to be giving like three points, so I I want to know if everybody is doing all of them. Go ahead. Okay. So um uh, uh uh so when you're answering is a. Uh, the, uh, the first thing I have is, uh, do you have any concerns about liability um, serving as a board member? And then the typical answer we get is, no, uh, well, why not? Well, uh, because there's insurance we're told and we're indemnified by the unit owners. And that is all true. But I'm going to take you back to May 5th, 2017. And in a condominium of South Boston, two engaged doctors, Boston doctors, uh, in the penthouse unit were uh, tortured and murdered by a former security person or concierge person at the condominium. Uh, the people sued with the board, the manager, and the two manage uh, and the two security companies. Uh, uh, this was May 2017. Uh, I'm I'm told several years ago, I believe it was that the association, incredibly, had a hundred million dollars 
of umbrella liability, and I believe $100 million of DNO liability. But this would have been a comprehensive general liability uh, because it resulted in bodily injury and death. So if you have a million dollars of insurance, or two million or five million, uh, what happens if there's a judgment, as in the Fields case, it's confidential, so we don't know for certain, but I'm pretty confident that it's uh, it's settled for over $20 million in 2023. So six years, six years later. Um, if you had 1 million of insurance or 5 million and $20 million uh, judgment, where does the other 15 million come from? And the first answer is going to be, well, the judgment is going to be against the trustees, if it's a Massachusetts, I and mean, if it's a trust. And then it's, oh, wait a second, we're indemnified. Uh, that's only as good as how much insurance you have, because in Massachusetts, the limit of liability is endless. So in other words, if you have to assess the unit owners for $15 million shortfall, then... The, the, the plaintiffs can seek the $15 million from, let's say, the 50 unit owners who own units according to their percentage interest. So, uh, that does not give me a whole lot of comfort. And um, I think on that one, if up to this point, everything that I said, you're fully aware of that and knew this before, um, uh, write in the chat or, 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 or raise your hands if Jake can watch uh, as to that you are, already knew all that. Because it seems to me that if you knew all that, that the million dollars that Fannie Mae has had since 1979, at one point they blipped it up to three million, they went back to one million, but it's woefully inadequate. Uh, they don't talk about directors and officers insurance at all. Um, and uh, even for co-ops, Fannie requires $3 million. So my concern is that post-Surfside, which ended up with a $1.2 billion, with a B, um, million dollar settlement among 37 parties. Um, and after the Fields case in South Boston, that settled in 2023 for what we believe was over $20 million. Uh, there's reason to be uh, to be afraid. And one of the questions I would say is, in addition, uh, uh, here's your homework. I'd like everybody who's on this webinar, uh, who's a board member or a managing agent, uh, to have your managing agent or on your own, talk to your insurance agent and get a quote. Don't bind it, but get a quote for, let's say, a $10 million policy uh, over, and this is important, over both your comprehensive general liability and your directors and officers liability. Because it's generally fairly small dollars uh, for each additional million. And I can't tell you that the right answer is 10 million or 25 or, or 50 or 100 million. I can tell you that 1 million or 2 million these days is way too low. Uh, there's another problem. Some even good directors and officers liability policies, at least six months ago, but maybe they've changed it now, uh, uh, in the fine print, if it were a $2 million policy for the board in the fine print, the management company coverage was only for a million, no matter what. And I'm not sure a whole lot of board members or even managers understand that, but check that out with your agent to make sure that the manager has the same amount of coverage because the manager is going to get named just because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time they're going to get sued because of the, they're the manager in addition to the board. And then ask your agent about uh, the um, uh, what's called legal fees within the limits or outside the limits. 
So if you have a case from May 2017 that settles in 2023, good chance that there were, well, I, I, I believe that there were probably about $2 million of legal fees based on hours worked. Um, and I guess my question is, how many of you are aware that the uh, so some DNO policies deduct the amount of legal fees from the coverage. So if you have a million dollar policy and you have $2 million in legal fees that's paid by the insurer, the insurer has paid the limits of the policy. Uh, my concern is I'm not sure how many of you know that. And I'm not saying that you should run out and uh, resign from the board, but it's starting to become a question. The other thing that I did, I used to have a, an agent to great insurance condominium agent who passed away, Bernie Gitlin, uh, and he was my personal agent. And uh, uh, because I was on nonprofit boards, I had a five million or ten, or I have a five million or a ten million dollar umbrella policy on my personal insurance uh, because I'm concerned as to what protections. Um, uh, we put homestead protections on houses. We do other things because post the two surgeons and post Surfside, uh, uh, there's risk that somehow we've been lucky to avoid over the past 40 years. And uh, um, I'm concerned that it can't be uh, what are the chances that would happen to us? If you think that way, you wouldn't have any insurance. So um, I'm turning it back to Jake because I'm losing my voice. And uh, uh, but uh, if, if that, I'd prefer it being chat. But if if anybody knew all of that, um, could you type? Even if it's anonymously, we already knew all that. And if you don't type that, I'll assume that you didn't. And I hope that will be of uh, some uh, some value in terms of this webinar. Now back to Jake on the main topic. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, it, it is uh, it is important uh, and and very important topics that that you got to today, uh, or, or what you just discussed in the. And I'll let you get to. I think there are some questions. Um, uh, so I think that 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 is useful uh, to kind of take a look at. Um, insurance is kind of, I think with a lot of issues we talk about, the underlying insurance um, is 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 kind of an important uh, aspect to be aware of. Uh, and again, DNO is super important. Uh, and that kind of ties right into what we're discussing today as far as board members and and their requirements and and the the heightened fiduciary responsibility. Um, and, and I do want to just share the the also the uh, the majority of uh, answers were five million dollars or below. Uh, we we received um, mostly, yeah, most answers were five million um, for how much general liability in DNO and umbrella. Um, next was two million, and then one million, uh, and then we got a couple answers as to ten million and twenty five million. Yeah, there were, there were only three total. Uh, there were two at ten million, and there was one at twenty five million. That's correct. So, so I think that's uh, just a, just an important. And, and, and I I'm, and I hit the share button, so I hopefully people can see the results as well. Excellent. Yeah. So, so, the, so that is a, a a very important topic and something that uh, it it's a crisis everywhere. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a tricky area, um, and something that, that, that needs to be, uh, really considered and, 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 and definitely something that you don't want to short out on. Um, and, and, and one final comment is because of, uh, Surfside and cases like, uh, the Fields case out of South Boston and wildfires, uh, and hurricanes in Florida with the insurer of last resort uh, citizens, the state 
Fairplan insurer became the insurer of first resort. Uh, premiums have skyrocketed. Uh, agents are frantically trying to layer even property damage coverages because carriers are getting scared of a uh, very large property damage risk. Uh, they're excluding wildfire. They're insuring roofs at actual cash value, which doesn't comply with Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac requirements uh, or guidelines and uh, what insurance carriers are doing uh, is hitting a wall. Uh, and I know the insurance industry has uh, uh, reached out to put a pause on what's going on in the insurance market. So uh, uh, more liability and tougher to get insurance for 100% replacement costs than for all the potential liability that you could have, because there's also layered liability policies where carriers are sharing the risk. Um, uh, it's sort of the perfect storm. Yep. Oh, yeah. I, I think a lot of a lot of issues that are occurring are are the perfect financial storm. Um, as far as yeah, I mean, insurance is the biggest is is the backbone of all of it. Um, and that goes right into lending. Uh, you know, uh, the requirements of uh, keeping up with structural integrity, reserve requirements, uh, everything in between. But I want to get into uh, the the what we, what we're going to really delve into is what what board requirements are changing. What what you already have a fiduciary duty um, as a board member. Uh, that's different than a property manager who's usually uh, a, a, the paid employee. Uh, to handle and manage the operations of the board and association as a whole. Um, so what we're seeing, and this is, again, directly related to Surfside, the hammocks embezzlement case, um, the board requirements, uh, I, I, one of the biggest things I want to point out is, and I mentioned it earlier, transparency, but transparency with uh, records maintenance and request compliance. Uh, so what 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 we'll see as far as best practice and guidance, uh, and again, not specific legal advice, is for board members uh, to properly maintain and provide condo records. Uh, Jay, Jay, can I stop you one more time? I apologize. Uh, just, just the caps uh, um, to summarize four posts in chat. Uh, one was I've, I've learned some valuable information today. Uh, uh, somebody else didn't know about all that about insurance. Um, uh, and no, I didn't know all of this. But then uh, one of my favorite insurance people of all time, Kevin Davis out of the great state of California, Los Angeles, uh, assures me that uh, policy, directors and officers policies limiting the management company's coverage only one million dollars, even if the associations is a bigger policy. He assures me that that is even true today. And my guess is not a well. I know Kevin knows it, but because uh, he's a managing general agent for a, a fantastic travelers bond specialized mono lined DNO policy. Um, uh, but not everybody knows as much as Kevin Davis knows. Very, very few people do. Sorry, Jake. Oh, that's absolutely, hey, absolutely. Kevin Davis. But, but, but you know Kevin, so we had to give him a shout out. I saw Kevin Davis last week. It was great to see you, Kevin. Great to connect with Eric as well. And uh, yeah, no, that was a great, we had a great, great dinner in Vegas. Uh, sorry to uh, 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 kind of uh, take a step back, but uh, it was, yeah, definitely, uh, Kevin Davis, he's the, he's the expert in the stuff, uh, good contact, um, in the insurance industry. Um, so, and, to and, and I think they have, uh, either 33,000 or 40,000 community association directors and officers liability policies mm -hmm. in the United States. And they also do fidelity insurance and crime and, uh, 
um, uh, cyber, uh, cyber liability, which is a, another risk that associations uh, should think long and hard about getting it because there's no coverage if you don't. Uh, now I'll turn it back to, to Jake, but uh, uh, we had to give Kevin at least three minutes of his 15 minutes of fame. Oh yeah, he deserves more than that. Uh, but anyways, uh, so so what I what I want to point out is the biggest takeaway that I took from what is called Condo 3.0 bill. That's the legislation that I keep referring to in Florida that could make its way to other jurisdictions in the near future, long term future. Uh, it, it it it's probably going to make its way into other jurisdictions in one way or another. Uh, the big, the biggest thing that stood out to me beyond just general transparency and regulation is this requirement as to condo records, maintaining proper condo records, uh, making sure that uh, you kind of, actually, we just got a really good question. Why would folks volunteer for uh, this kind of goes to the impetus? A lot of board member, and, and sorry for backtracking here, but I wanted to point out, these are volunteer positions. Um, and I will get into it in the program a little later, just about how you already have fiduciary responsibility as a board member. We're already having difficulty getting people to volunteer, especially in uh, a little more chaotic associations. Um, it, these, this condo 3.0 bill, uh, it almost it, it, it disincentivizes even more uh, but in the long run, it is a good thing, uh, there, there, and we do get to kind of what we expect is next. Uh, it's not it's not necessarily what's going to happen, but what we could kind of policy wise expect, and what we would push for as far as legislation and other jurisdictions across the nation. Um, and, and we, you know, Stephen and I have been involved a little bit nationally, uh, which is which is the with with community associations institute CAI. Uh, which if you're not involved with, very important to get involved with. Uh, it, it is the go-to uh, community association network. Um, everything, you, it, it is the resource to go to for this in this field. Uh, that being said, board members, yes, it's it's a tough position. It, it's, it, you know, it, it almost seems like uh, you, you're just stuck and, and it can be hard to get people to, to run, especially in the more... Uh, <laughs> disheveled communities. Oh, 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 I think, and, and sorry for keep jumping in here. I promise you for the last 14 webinars and now for the 15th that I won't interrupt. <laughs> and I do it, do it constantly, but uh, somebody on the list is saying uh, something that we all knew, which is this is why people don't like lawyers and politicians. Uh, I know nobody likes me, uh, a few people like Jake, uh, but he doesn't act as a uh, lawyer. As to the politicians, be careful, because one of the su suggestions we have here is should, and, and other states may have it, uh, my friend Mark, Ke uh, Mark Markell, uh, a big attorney in uh, Texas uh, for condominiums and homeowner associations, um, um, uh, uh, has uh, 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 done a summary of the state of the law in terms of liability. It's 13 years old in all 50 states. Um, uh, and some uh, states cap the liability, sometimes to the equity in the unit, sometimes to the amount of the mortgage. Um, but what we'd like to see, if I'm not sure it's ever been discussed, at least in Massachusetts, is to introduce legislation that would cap liability as it does to municipal uh, as it does to municipalities because um, uh, we are always considered as quasi governmental like uh, entities and I, uh, I believe that municipalities are capped at twenty thousand dollars and that uh, nonprofit uh, true nonprofits five hundred one c three such as hospitals a cap at a hundred thousand. Uh, we'd like to see that. And short of that, we'd like to see boards, and this is brand new, uh, as far as I know, I've never heard it in the last 40 years. It, well, I've heard it once uh, from a general attorney in uh, New Jersey, 
is putting in amendments uh, for tort immunity that I think would at least apply and be bound, uh, 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 binding against unit owners and their occupants. I'm not sure it would be binding against tenants or not or visitors, but uh, to set the limits because by the end of this, uh, my rhetorical question that might become a real one is at some point, who in the right mind is going to serve on a board? Should we start? Uh, and are we going to get the worst unit owners eventually to serve because nobody else will? And uh, again, something I've been talking about for 30 or 40 years, but I think it's coming to the forefront is do we need professional paid board members? For example, a condominium management company that serves solely as the board of directors and has a man other management company under, under it. I know we're feeding you with a lot of information that's probably making everybody nauseous. Um, but I guess my question is, if you haven't heard this up to now, and I really don't think you have, then wouldn't you rather know and go in with the eyes wide open versus being in a position where there could be some risk to becoming a trustee because one of your neighbors wanted you to and because uh, your spouse thought it would be a good way to meet the neighbors. It would be, yeah. uh, it's probably a good way to meet the neighbors, but you probably won't like what they're meeting you about and you'll probably be afraid to go to the swimming pool. Yeah. I see it in a lot of uh, especially high rise communities where you kind of have to go up and down an elevator. You can't if you're a board member. Yeah, you, you can't go. Let's say you have a pool. <laughs> you can't go there because you're going to get hectored with questions. The, uh, so to that point, the board member, I've heard from many uh, industry experts, uh, paid board members could be in the near future or more commonly. It has, it's it, in some jurisdictions. I know in Florida, it's technically allowed, but it has to be in the bylaws. Um it's tri it's it's hard to it's harder to get. And uh, one one other interruption over my hundred interruptions up to now is it's an old example. So the numbers have changed. But I used to tell people ten years ago, well, if you have a hundred unit condominium and you're on the board, um, and each unit is worth five hundred thousand, which in some areas of the country is probably a modest amount at this point. You're running a $50 million real estate business and condominium business. And you probably have great expertise in whatever your real job is or was. Very successful people are on, on these boards. But when it comes to dealing with issues with their neighbors, uh, it's their only failure in life is, is that um, it, it's tougher. Uh, but if you keep in mind you're running a $50 million asset, hopefully that will shine on you that that's not something for volunteers to leap into too quickly, unless you have the very best surrounded by the very best of experts on legal issues and property management and insurance and engineering. Um, so I just throw that out there since I've gone, uh, I've gone this far in, in explaining my concerns and I apologize for doing it, but I hope somebody will type, uh, uh, even though it was painful, we are glad that you, share these concerns, Stephen. I don't see anybody typing, but if you want, Jake, back to you. Okay. Yes. So uh, we get, we have a lot to get to in this last 12 minutes. I really want to, I really want to point out. You should have managed your time better. It takes two to tango. <laughs> <laughs> so what I do want to get into is kind of uh condo 3.0 bill in Florida house bill uh, uh house bill 1203 house bill 1021 uh again keep mentioning florida because it 
makes its way into other jurisdictions. Uh, this is overhauling association operations. And the backdrop of that is structural integrity requirements as of, uh, and reserve requirements as of this year required by statute. Um, and now we're getting to board member requirements. And I do wanna just run off a list of items that I found to be uh, interesting or that stuck out to me uh, in the bill. Um, official records. Again, I, I keep going back to it. Official records are a huge, a huge uh, reason why this has come into play and transparency with official records. Uh, the 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 thing that comes here is, is is I highly recommend getting with counsel or an attorney um, to discuss implementing reasonable rules as it relates to official records. This is kind of a good best practice. Um, I do think the Massachusetts statute is quite vague as far as what is is kind of required um and for example uh, what i mean by that is it it's a reasonable time to provide the uh financial records what is a reasonable time is kind of ambiguous uh so in implementing timeline requirements for example in florida it's 10 days i think that's quick um but yeah i, I think a reasonable time that could be a month two months it, it's not very clear so the other thing I want to point out, you need to make sure you're accounting for all your fi uh, financial records uh, and books of the association. Look, there's turnover with boards. Things get lost in the shuffle. The new requirement with the managers uh, or the bill uh, in Florida with the managers having to provide within 20 days the, the books and records of the association um, is good after being terminated, I, I should say. Uh, because there's some continuity there. Things get lost in the shuffle. I see it in our litigation practice all the time. We're like, we're going through discovery. The other side needs documentation to the proof where, to the case we're trying to prove or defend, and we don't have the information. So it's I can't emphasize this enough. It is so important to maintain records in an organized and reasonable fashion. Um, so... And look, here, here's here's the thing. Uh, the statute that what we could see is a is is requirements to not only get documents that you have, but get the documents that you know it, you have to make a good faith attempt to recreate the documents. You can't just say, "Oh, we lost it. Oh, we can't. Oh, that was the prior board. Oh, we can't find it." Um, you have to make a good faith attempt to recreate the documents, whether that's reaching out to a prior board, reaching out to a prior manager. Um, you you, you got to try to obtain absent records. Again, what if there's a request? And I think I think the timeline. I would say, at least we say in a, in our field, it's seven years um, uh, to to keep records for. Um, you know, try try to maintain records, and that that goes to. Um, you know, having a website, just have everything on the website. Uh, if, if it's if it's easy to manage, there's plenty of software companies that we can recommend. Um, and, and it's just it's a good it's a good practice to to have a website. If, if you're a larger community, I mean, I, I wouldn't say if you're a 10 unit community, it's it's necessarily uh, required. It might actually cost more than 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 you know, implementing just a general good practice for notice requirements and organizing your documents in a in a file uh, that is easily shareable or uh, uh, easy to inspect. Uh, a few more things. Uh, furnish checklist uh, of records uh, when you get a records request uh, or an inspection request. Uh, and this should be a checklist of what you have, what you don't have. We can provide examples of of what that may look like. And, and what you should be maintaining? Uh, do you keep every email? Do you keep? And and I know I know you'll I know you'll interrupt me again, Stephen. A good best practice is to make sure as a board member, don't use your Gmail account for board operations. Use a specific email that's devoted to the association operations. Were you going to say that, Stephen? Yeah, the yeah. Um, it's an offshoot to be careful of what you say in public because be prepared for it to be in the uh, tonight's uh, uh, newspaper. That's when they used to be newspapers. Um, 
the um, uh, if there's a, we suggest that you have if you have the ABC condominium trust uh, or association, get the domain name ABC condominium trust or association. Also, service mock the name so there are no uh, unit owners who are doing nasty sites who are using uh, your association's name. So protect the service mock, protect the name with the service mock to protect the reputation. But it will do two things. One, it will take your email, all your emails, which be in the thousands, and narrow it to just condominium business ones. The other thing it will do, hopefully, is knowing that it's a separate, specific condominium uh, domain name where you, you change the directors and take people off and on as the uh, directors change, um, you might think more about what you post versus if you just have an informal uh, email exchange where it's, oh, Joe in Unit 101 is a loser. Uh, I hate him. These are the 10 reasons. Uh, uh, you probably don't want all your emails discovered in discovery. Um, exactly. And, and I wanted to point out, so I- I, oh, I thanks I, for interrupting me. I, <laughs> I went, I, I did deal with an arbitration where this exact issue came up and yeah, you don't want everything to be uh, kind of available in discovery. Um, we went through, it ended up and they kept the, 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 uh, the board or the association had kept paper records uh, or they did, had not created paper records. They had some stuff in email. They had to recreate through their Gmail because some operations were sent, you know, it was emails to, to unit owners. Um, and it, I didn't, I didn't agree with the case. I thought, I thought, I thought uh, it shouldn't have been every email is discoverable from your Gmail account. Um, but the arbitrator wasn't hearing it that day. Um and, and so that's just a word of caution. Uh, someone did mention is condo uh, condo bill three condo three bill isn't an association with twenty five units or more. Now you will have to have a website. That is correct. In, July, in Florida, in Florida. Sorry, yes, and that that will likely come into effect July first. Um, twenty five units or more, and I I I think that luckily in other jurisdictions, if you're not in Florida, that is good, but also a word of caution just to say, okay, uh, you know what? Maybe we should consider a website. Let's see what the software companies, let, let's see the cost of this. Let's see. Let's just make sure it's easier for it. There's that, there is that kind of uh, uh, a bridge to get there. Um, but once you're there, the efficiency of getting information out and making sure your, your uh, community is transparent um, is, is, is important. And, and again, I, I think I think uh, it, with the websites, it's 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 almost it, it's only accessible for unit owners with a portal, or, or should be accessible to unit owners with like a portal login um, to to access all the documents, uh, especially agenda, meetings, contracts, uh, competitive bids. All right, we have we got to get to all we got to get to the rest of this though. Penalties for willful and repeated violations, increased penalties. This could include criminal. I don't want to scare you. This is this is like um, if it's the the hammocks embezzlement case. I don't think they're. I don't think it's not going to be criminal penalties as if it's not willful and repeated. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Websites twenty five units or more. Uh, these are board member requirements that we kind of are suggesting based on this Florida legislation. Uh, contracts to be approved must be attached to an agenda. So if you have a, a meeting, uh, make sure to include any contracts to be considered. And the reasoning for this is the conflict of interest type of thing um, for transparency for unit owners to vote on contracts. Um, there is also a, a new manager. For some reason, the Florida legislation, they separated it between HOA and condo. I'm not enter entirely sure why. Uh, some some requirements for an HOA, some requirements for a condo. Uh, I don't, I, it, I, I think it, it's a little, I, I think the practices can apply to both. Um, but so for property managers solicit, comp uh, there is a new change to solicit competitive bids. So for example, you can't just go to one person and say, oh, we're good. Um, and that goes right to contracts being approved or contracts being, 
uh, that to be approved must be attached to the agenda. Agenda, um, Board meetings, uh, depending on the size, uh, it is required to meet at least quarterly. Um, it, have a board meeting at least quarterly. Uh, that, that, that would mean, you know, it, 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 uh, getting your, your uh, board together, but also to take it a step further, a lot, you cannot just, I know I see it in a lot of meetings, unfortunately, um, where, uh, or I hear about it more so where, where unit owners are either muted or told not to ask questions. There's now going to be it, it, through condo 3.0 bill, uh, you have to allow members to ask questions about status of construction projects uh, and revenues and exp expenses for the current fiscal year. I think that's a good practice. Uh, make sure you're being transparent. Allow the unit owners to ask questions, especially to, to those two areas. Um, new uh, uh, parameters as far as electronic voting. Uh, that Again, I, I think that's just important. Uh, notify owners, uh, or, you know, I think it's important to notify owners 90, what's in Florida, must notify owners 90 days prior to election of delinquency status and possible suspension of voting rights. Um, this, this last one's a big one, continuing education requirements. Um, in Florida, the new requirements will be an initial session, which is a four hour class for board members. Uh, and then on top of that, a one hour yearly update required certificate valid for seven years of continuous service um, and must certify annually that all directors complied with the educational requirements. And then as to uh, CAM requirements, and for some, again, for some reason, it's just for HOAs, um, but in Florida, but again, this is something to consider if you're a property manager. Um, the new requirement is to attend in person at least one meeting per year. Uh, I think it's easier on Zoom. I mean, I'm glad we can do this and do it via Zoom and technology is great, but uh, I, I think the having a in-person meeting with uh, your CAM is is also important. Um, uh, furnish so, yeah, there might be some who disagree. I mean, having having automobiles for the environment isn't a good thing if they're all driving around. Some people, as they get older or whatever, it's just it's just more comfortable not having to drive someplace. So uh, there is some. Um, um uh, uh, not everything in this bill is loved by CAI chapters or managers down in down in uh, uh Florida. Some say the state should stay out of private contracts. Um uh, uh but there are arguments both ways. But because it's a couple of minutes past eleven, Jake, I I I, I just want to say one thing that we haven't mentioned before either which is we'll, we'll probably go another 10, 15 minutes if people want to hang around. But if your boards or management or managers, if you're a management company, or even if you're an insurance carrier or a yeah, insurance agent, um, if you want us to be, because uh, I do awful at time management, uh, and there was just so much information here and maybe specific questions you have. If you want a free um, Zoom meeting with Jacob, myself, or other people from the office, uh, with your board or with your managers, if you're a management company, insurers, et cetera, uh, we are happy to do that at no cost uh say a, a one hour uh program uh so that if there's one board member on a call today on this call uh that perhaps you could have all five of them on a uh specialized uh, uh zoom meeting just for or microsoft teams meeting just for you so notify jake or myself uh, Jake at amcondolaw.com if that's of interest. Jake, sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so yeah, just the, I, I think both for, there, there is also more uh, CAM uh, property manager uh, heightened requirements for uh, education, uh, additional education that is, is being considered. Um, 
So that's that. I think that's just important. And, and some of the topics that would include inspection, structural integrity, levying fines, budget, financial literacy, um, even your own governing documents. Uh, taking a look at those. Um, so yeah, I, I I I think there's so many changes. Uh, we do. I wanted to get to kind of what do we? Okay, th then this is you know talking about property manager responsibilities and education attending board meetings, uh, contracts, you know, soliciting competitive bids is a good practice. Um, making sure you disclose any conflicts. Uh, it's important to disclose that. Um, and, and ensuring that everything is, is, is provided and transparent as possible. Uh, again, this is kind of what we've gone over. Uh, and we'll send out this PowerPoint. Sorry, I'm rushing through it, but we we there's so much to talk about. Uh, so yeah, I I think uh, what else could we see? What what's what's kind of the next next uh, steps? How do we encourage board members to run for the board? Um, you know, I, I I think a big thing is uh, ensuring that we're staying on top of all the changes. Uh, one bullet point I want to point out on this slide, what else could we see? Paid, we talked about it a bit, paid board members instead of volunteers. I think that could be a good policy change. There's more intricacies to that because right now as it's, as it's kind of set up is the board has the fiduciary responsibility is, and is more or less the volunteer um, while the manager is the uh, uh, impartial third uh, party that is kind of overseeing and managing the operations uh, and, and, and kind of involved on the outside, but usually have on-site managers who are, who are in, 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 in pretty constant interaction with the board. Um, but the, the, the manager is the paid employee of the association, while the board members are the volunteers, but have the increased responsibilities and duties uh, fiduciary, uh, uh, under fiduciary basis. So it, it's tricky. Uh, I did hear someone in Vegas over at the CAI national event this past week, um, say, so, so it goes hand in hand with what we're discussing, uh, requiring certified management companies that, that can be tricky. Uh, and, and I think with, with the, with the heightened education and, and all that, um, it's something that might make sense though. Uh, it, it might make sense to kind of make sure that your management company is 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 kind of is at a certain caliber. Um, and, and look, they have they do have the CAM requirements, LCAM. Um, that is one kind of barrier to to weed out the bad players um, and 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 make sure that you <laughs> are adequately managed. Um, there, there might be other measures that we, we could see, uh, just some other things that we might see, um, in purchases, maybe uh, this goes hand in hand with disclosures, uh, and, and making sure that everything is, is transparent as possible background checks and financial income that, that might be something that board members do, um, or have, have more requirements to do. We, I mean, we see it in Florida a lot. I don't really see it as much in Massachusetts in the condo community. Um, and then lending changes, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, that is a huge topic that we're seeing. Um, there's the Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, technically, that is a, a statute. Um, that's a statute. And it, it, it's... Uh, uh, we recommend we recommend filing uh, if you're a board member uh, under the Corporate Transparency Act. There are some there is some legislation or actually um, th there, there is some some uh, law going on in Alabama that is kind of trying to get more exempt status, especially for small businesses. But we would recommend at least our suggestion is to, to file. It is the law you haven't you do have until the end of the year. Uh, we do have a, a a portal that you can use to to file, um, but yeah, I I think that there's there's so there's so much going on that that that's just the, the corporate transparency act is just another <laughs> another another new board requirement as of now, um, 
at least in our opinion. Uh, but the, everything else in between and everything else that we can expect in the future um, is coming up. And, and, and we have a couple of bullet points here. What else can board members do? How do we encourage board members to run? Again, compliance with statutory changes, making sure if you're, if you're already keeping up with the educational requirements, that may go hand in hand. But I think it's always important to stay in contact. Again, we're just the attorneys. Stay in contact with your attorneys. But also, we, a lot of us in the community have a lot of different resources from insurance agents, making sure your insurance is properly uh, handled, making sure that you reach out to a reserve advisor if you need to. To ensure that your reserve account is up is 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 good to go, um, reaching out reaching out to uh, even even security people uh, as as Stephen had mentioned, uh, security and premises liability is a huge topic in light of Surfside and the uh, Fields uh, double homicide case, um, and. <laughs> And, and yeah, I, I I think I think there's there's a lot of other engineers is another one to ensure structural integrity, um, getting with a, a a a getting with the right people and having a good team of uh, Avengers uh, to kind of keep up with everything, not just the legal developments, statutory changes, to keep up with every every facet of your community uh, is, is a huge. Being proactive is is one of the biggest. Um, biggest things that I would recommend. Board Immunity uh, Association's Defense Council, um, as Stephen got to, getting the right insurance in place, directors and officers, if, you, if you're, you know, the, the board, make sure you're protected from being sued uh, directly. And, um, and, and also the comprehensive general liability. So for cases like the murder liability. where it ended up with bodily injury, death, or personal property, that would come under CGL, um, uh, uh, whereas DNO could, could cover other items, including non-monetary damages, but will not uh, typically uh, defend if there's bodily injury or property damage. Fantastic. Um, what else? I, I think that's enough. enough. We've got what's it, it, People can call my cell is 781-413-5226. You can email us. Um, I would be happy to do a uh, free Zoom meeting uh, with your boards or with your, uh, uh, if a management company with your managers or if management companies want to invite their board members to also be on the, the Zoom meeting, we could do that. But uh, um, uh, uh, there's a lot there's a lot to this so we apologize after the fact if we said things that made people a little nervous but we thought we had a responsibility to let us know of some of the fears that we have um, so you can do with them as you as you want excellent yeah we already we, we still have a lot of people here so I mean um any more questions? It's a lot. Yeah, again, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of scary information. Um, but I think if you're keeping up with uh with with certain with with certain uh developments, uh you you're 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 in a good spot. Um are there any four hour courses currently available that could satisfy the CEU requirements for board of trustees now? Uh, we can look into that. I, I'm sure there's, I'm sure now, especially with these developments, they're, they're probably offering. So a, that would be Florida. That would be in Florida. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that's it. from my understanding, I don't know if it'd be classes like this. Cause it'd just be, you know, Steven and I chit chatting about Taylor Swift. So you wouldn't learn anything, but there's some, some attorneys are teaching classes or webinars in this format. Uh, and those from my understanding, satisfy the C, uh, continuing education requirements. I, I think one manager down there, maybe Campbell, I, I think does the same. It's a good, yep. Uh, um, they, they bring in guests like politicians and other folks and attorneys. And, and that, yeah, I think that's important. I, I, I think a lot of this, um, Florida's all, Florida is the guinea pig in a lot of these issues. 
uh, they approved, they, they, they statutorily added uh, the electronic voting in 2015. Massachusetts has still not added, um, uh, and, and we're working on it, but legislatively to get uh, the electronic voting um, yeah. approved. Um, but I, know, it, I think it, I, I think the, uh, the legislature has been sidelined by COVID bills for the state. And then some of the diversity, equity, inclusion issues. Uh, I have a good feeling that the uh, Senate and House in Massachusetts uh, might pass this before the end of the session on July 31st, uh, 2024. I know we have CAI and Matt Gaines and Peter Westhaver working feverishly on uh, trying to do as much as possible to pass these bills. It's House Bill 1338 and Senate Bill 900. If you have uh, politicians uh, that you're uh, friendly with that uh, you could you think would help us pass, allowing for virtual meetings and electronic voting, uh, please let us know. And uh, hopefully that passes, but you can also do it by a bylaw amendment to your documents. Uh, and not worry about whether the legislature uh, acts or not. Are we, are we sort of out of time, Jake? We've had, had these nice people here for 15 minutes more than we we promised. I'm trying to find any other questions. I think we're I think we're pretty. pretty yeah, I think we're pretty caught up, but but we're going to send a link to the recording, uh, a copy of the PowerPoint, and. I'm going to need Jake's help on this because some of them are specific to uh, Florida. Uh, answers to every question that was in the chat, if Jake makes a copy of it and sends it to me and all. Yeah. Uh, so um, you, you probably get that by next Tuesday or Wednesday. We just got a, an interesting question. How is the current issue with pyrotite pyro in concrete impacting the responsibility of boards and MA? We, yeah, we, we've done a few present, uh, we've done past presentations and have got questions on pyrotite. Uh, Japanese knotweed. Um, I haven't heard too much. What 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 have you? I mean that that's something that's usually a uh, considered a latent defect. Uh, but Stephen, what is what are you hearing? On uh, this? Uh, uh, okay, so the problem is it was concrete only used within a certain uh, radius of a place in Co Connecticut, so it's affecting some Metro West uh, Massachusetts condominiums. Uh, it was a product used a long, long time ago that now people are finding is uh, failing. And uh, there are some, there's some state legislation and some, uh, and at least one state advocacy group uh, that is looking into the issue. Uh, but I guess I would suggest that because uh, uh, it seems to be a specific person who keeps raising the issue is that you circle back with your manager and have them circle back with your with their uh, the law firm for the association and then uh, Google I think on Facebook you're going to find that there are interest groups that are pushing for this because if it's bad it's sort of like all the concrete has to be removed uh, or there's eventually going to be a disaster. Uh, so it's a serious question, but it's a specific question limited to only some condominiums. And I think that's best dealt with with your, your manager, your legal team, and your engineers. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. No, that's, I mean, that's a good, good answer. Uh, I think the biggest thing is we're just lowly attorneys. We can only advised so much um i i i i uh i think a lot of what we tend to kind of uh see and what we we try to navigate as attorneys is getting you in touch with the right people who are able to take it the step further who have the uh, insight into the specific issues involved getting the right engineer out to the property uh if it's an insurance issue getting the right insurance broker insurance carrier uh, on the scene, um, navigating a an insurance claim if you're a, a, an owner uh, or board member, getting a public adjuster. 
Um, if you are, are, you know, need reserve studies done, getting a reserve uh, specialist out. Um, okay. I think it's really important to have a team of experts uh, to really get involved with everything. Um, and at least, at least, at least get to, to, to make sure that everything's operating smoothly. Um, Thanks everybody for, for joining us. Sorry for keeping you so late. Thanks for all the people who stayed on. We'll be sending a copy of the link to this, uh, webinar. If you want to share it with your, your board members or managers, et cetera, um, uh, we will also send answers to all the questions that were asked. Uh, even if we answer them today, uh, uh, and uh, we will send the PowerPoint. And I thought there might be an article that Jake had on uh, 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 board member liability, but I'm not 100% sure of that. So thank you. Have a great weekend. Yes, and, appreciate and appreciate everyone. Uh, if, if you want to email us, we have our emails right here on the uh, final slide. But we do appreciate everyone showing up today and staying late. Even uh, I'm sure there's a lot, a lot more fun things you'd want to do on this nice Friday morning. But here we are. Uh, so hopefully it was useful. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, and happy to answer any questions further because it, this apparently this does seem like a a hot topic with it with everyone uh, with everyone attending. So appreciate it. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. Talk soon. Uh, and signing off for the Marcus Hour, Jake Marcus. Jake, do you cut and paste the chat in the q &A? Yes, sir. Okay, if you send that to me, I'm doing some of them. I think I'm going to need your answers. And uh, uh, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you later, Stephen. Okay, thanks. Thanks, sir. Good job, Jake. Sorry for the interruptions. No, you did great. Even with your cold. <laughs> okay. Uh, bye. All right. Bye.